I think community and agriculture are inherently related to each other, at least small scale agriculture. And I think that they lend to creating the other when you have one. Um, I think no matter what your relationship is when you start to grow things, whether it's about your relationship to food or your relationship to like the climate that's in your immediate area or your relationship to the people around you, growing things is relationship building and like relationship care. So I think it's just kind of a natural progression to expand your concept of what relationships you're caring for to the people around you. Um, and I think no matter what resources you have, whether you have space or time or materials or information or money to buy materials, um, there's always something that you can grow. Okay, cool. All right. Um, my name is M. I use he, they pronouns. I live in Maine. Um, I have been gardening for the vast majority of my life, and I currently work um, in seed distribution. I work for Johnny Selected Seeds as an operations supervisor in the distribution center. Um, I oversee three departments in the distribution center. I oversee seed packing, warehouse, and shipping functions. Um, so I pretty much run the evening shift. Essentially, it's the entire process from getting the seeds shipped in from vendors to packing them from bulk into smaller like envelopes or buckets or bags, et cetera, um, and then sending them out to the customers. So it is really interesting to work in that environment. It's, it's a little building in, uh, in central Maine that looks pretty unassuming, but it's got billions of seeds inside of it. Um, so the kind of like potential energy of everything in there is really amazing. And there's just like seeds all over the place. Um, so yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly, I would say a pretty abundant environment and it's one that a lot of farmers and gardeners work there. So it's a relatively tight knit community of people who are sharing gardening information and sharing the things that they harvest from their gardens with each other. Um, yeah, so it's a really nice place to be. Um, so soil blocking is a pretty interesting way to start seedlings. Um, you use soil blockers. <laughs> um, these are ones that you can purchase. I have a number of sizes of them. Um, but there are also, I mean, there are a ton of resources online where people have made their own like DIY soil blocker out of tin cans or they 3D print them or they make them out of PVC pipe um, or Legos. I've seen people make them out of Legos. Um, it's a pretty basic concept. You're just making a compressed block of soil that you can push with a plunger. So any like receptacle with a plunger, you can make a soil block out of. Um, I had these available to me, so it's what I'm using, but I, I'm considering trying to make one for, there's like a big four inch soil block that you can purchase, but it's really expensive. So I'm thinking of trying to like Lego one of those <laughs> together. Um, so soil blocking has a number of benefits. Not only does it save plastic waste, um, you're not, I don't know about anybody else, but I always break the cell trays when I'm trying to get plants out of them and then I can't use them again. I know that you can get like more sturdy versions that you can pop plants out of, but I don't really want to invest in those. <laughs> um, so you are saving plastic waste for sure because your your soil blocks are like self-contained little, little seedling things. Look at this. Bring yeah. that real up close. Oh yeah. Wow. Like a, That's like, like a such a happy seedling, seedling right there. A little pepper seedling. <laughs> um, so there's a lot of benefits to the plant roots for growing it in this format. Generally in cell trays, when the roots reach the edge of the cell, they'll start to circle around it as though they've reached like an obstacle under the soil and they're trying to find their way to more soil. Um, but roots, as we know, don't generally like grow up into the air. So once it reaches the air, it air prunes the root. So the root understands there's no more soil. So I'm just going to stop and wait here. Um, so you don't get that like encircling of roots around it. Your roots will just essentially start to grow out when it gets to be too much for the soil block. So that means when you're transplanting it out, you're not messing with the root structure at all. You're just popping the little block into the earth <laughs> and the roots get to stay in the structure that they have decided to grow in. 
Um, so it really so you don't have to do the whole tickling process. You don't have to do the tickling process. You just take your little thing and you stick it in the ground <laughs> and the roots get to stay happy and undisturbed. Um, wow. For that reason, you can start things that you generally have to direct seed, um, like cucumbers and melons can be really finicky to transplant because they don't like their roots messed with, but you can start them in soil blocks. Um, and you can maximize your your growing window, especially I'm in Maine, so I'm trying to I'm always trying to maximize <laughs> my very short summer season. Um, so it really enables you to grow crops that you may not be able to grow otherwise, or may not be able to grow without some kind of covered structure like a hoop house or a tunnel. My understanding is that it makes a healthier root structure because they're not circling around. They can get to have essentially more surface area for absorption of water and soil minerals. Um, it also can save you space. I'm looking at my soil blocks as I'm talking. I should be looking at you. Um, so it saves me space. I have time to invest in the things I'm working on so I can do slightly more like labor intensive things like making 300 soil blocks in an afternoon, which does absolutely take longer than just filling a bunch of trays. Um, so I'm always willing to trade my time to maximize space, which is something I don't have a huge amount of, um, and to maximize materials. I really don't like to purchase things for gardening. It kind of like goes against <laughs> the vibe of why I'm producing food. Um, so I try to make the most of what I have. So soil blocking allows me to do that. Um, I have a heat mat and heat mats are really great for germinating a lot of seeds, especially flowers. I really like to grow flowers. It makes me happy. Um, so I can start, I can fit 300 of these little baby blocks into one 10 by 20 tray uh, and germinate them all at once. So I don't have to get more heat mats, which are expensive. And I don't really want more heat mats to use for like a month out of the year. Right. Um, so it helps to maximize space. It does just require some extra labor because you, a germination block is just a teeny tiny little thing. <laughs> it's very cute, right? But you can pot it so up. That's the different sizes of the soil blockers. Like what the smaller one would be a germination one and the larger one would be, what's the larger one called? This is like the regular, <laughs> like the original <laughs> soil block. These are called yes. blocks. And then you can get like mega blocks, which are the big orange ones. I don't have one of those, um, but you can get inserts. Oh, I just crushed my little soil block. You can get, <laughs> it's okay. But that's the fun of it. You can just make more soil blocks out of those tiny ones. <laughs> right. Right. It's foolproof. So <laughs> these little black squares in here are the size of the germination blocks so that you can just pop them in and have no root problems. I'm gonna go get another little mini block because I just like exploded this one. You get 20, 20 mini blocks out of one of these. You can fit 300 in a tray, which means that I can germinate the 300 seeds in one tray. You can fit 50 of these in one tray. So it would take me six trays to get the same amount of seedlings on a heat mat as the little baby ones can do in one tray. So that saves me a lot of space. These are teeny tiny. So they dry out pretty quickly. You have to really watch them and mist them a couple of times a day. That's kind of why I say I have time to devote to this. If, if you are not gonna be able to be like checking your seedlings religiously, um, then you probably are gonna have a good amount of death because they dry out super, super fast. Mm -hmm. But if you're on it, like I am, <laughs> or try to be, um, once your seedlings germinated in the teeny tiny blocks, you can pop them into the larger ones. I don't know if you can see that. There's just a little hole and you just you just stick it right in the hole. <laughs> and that's what I did with this one. This one started what? with a big block and oh. I put it up into a bigger one as soon as it germinated because it's a pepper seed and it needs heat to germinate. Um, because these blocks are so big, the heat doesn't like permeate into them. The soil temperature doesn't get as high as it does for the little baby blocks. So for peppers, which need to be like 80 to 90 degrees to germinate from the chili peppers that I'm growing, I have to start them in the little baby blocks so they're warm enough. And then once they germinate, I can pop them up and do a bigger one and they get to grow and be happy. So for somebody that might not have time to mist their germination blocks, um, what if you had some kind of like clear cover over it and like a little bowl of water inside there? Yeah. So I kind of already do that. Um, okay. I put my soil blocks on 
mesh trays mm -hmm. that sit inside of these bigger trays. So there's a little layer between them. So pretty often you won't be able to see, but there's like probably about a half an inch or so of space between the bottom of the mesh tray and the bottom of the, of the leak proof tray. So you absolutely do create humidity environments. I do put humidity domes over the top um, and water them like pretty generously so that there is water sitting in the bottom and it helps to make a nice little baby greenhouse. Um, and they do dry out slower that way, but they do still dry out at least once a day. I check on them. I try not to uncover them too much because that makes the temperature drop and it defeats the whole purpose. Um, my hands are going to be all dirty for the rest of this. Um, so there certainly are ways around it. And when you have the larger blocks, um, a lot of people recommend bottom watering them where you just put water in one of these trays and dunk the mesh tray into it. I'm using plastic mesh trays because it's what I had available to me for no money. <laughs> um, but people certainly make like plywood platforms or they use like metal baking tins. So you can totally do it without plastic at all. I just wow. have plastic that otherwise would have been thrown away. So I'm gonna use it for as long as I can use it. Totally. Um, yeah, so absolutely it's recommended to make a greenhouse environment because they still, a lot of seeds still really need humidity to germinate and the soil block does not like create its own humidity environment, especially when it's that tiny. Um, I think it also would depend on the environment you're growing it in. It's really, really dry here in the winter time. The humidity is usually at like 40%, which is pretty low or lower. Um, so everything dries out really, really fast. And it's kind of cold in my house because it's Maine. Um, yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> I have to create tiny little microclimates for them, even when I'm in my own house. But I'm sure if you lived in a more humid environment or a warmer environment, then you wouldn't want to do that necessarily because it would it might create a little bit of an algae problem or a mold problem. <laughs> yeah, so soil blocks, it saves you space. It gets you more oxygenated roots. Your roots have access to oxygen all the way around. That's part of the reason I use the mesh tray because there is no like solid bottom so they can have air access all the way around the block. Um, certainly no plastic waste, certainly less transplant stress. Um, it saves space when you're germinating things. It's very cute, which I feel like is a reasonable like purpose. <laughs> Definitely. Um, I would say the reasons that it can be inaccessible are that it does take extra time and care. Um, there is like a learning curve to getting the soil to be the right consistency and you need the right kind of soil. It doesn't work with any soil mixture. Mm -hmm. It has to be pretty finely ground, um, finely sifted, I suppose. And it, so if it has big chunks of like wood chips, et cetera, it's not gonna fill in to be a solid block and it'll just fall apart. Um, if it's not a material that absorbs water well, then it's not going to work. I use like a germination seedling mix, um, which is really finely sifted. And then I can make like a Play-Doh out of it essentially and just smash it into the blocks. <laughs> um, so it's, it can be relatively finicky and it takes like some research and trial and error to figure out how it's done. Um, but I think there are a lot of benefits to it. You can start things earlier. You can have less transplant stress when you're putting things outside. And I'm usually like, I get too excited about starting things. So I start things too early and I start <laughs> many things that I should just be direct seeding. And I teach myself that every year. <laughs> um, so this enables me to do that. Yeah. yeah. How long would that soil block last? decades i mean so this one that i already have i got for free because it is broken so we will see how long <laughs> this mm -hmm. one lasts because it does have plastic which is already broken um but this one which is all metal except for the dibbles these are called um no, they are not called they dibbles. are called dibbles they're interchangeable i had i had an example one they come with this little quarter inch dibble that makes just a tiny indent for direct seating and then mm -hmm. you can purchase these just snap out of here you can purchase these little square oh. ones that are the size of the germination block and they just pop into this little hole. Dibble. Uh, dibbles, just little, you can get you can get long dibbles for like deeper beans and stuff. <laughs> you get all kinds of dibbles for these things. Yeah. Um, so aside from the plastic parts, which are very cheap to replace um, and should last a long time, as long as you keep them clean and dry, They'll last, like, they'll last a while. They're galvanized. Um, I just try to make sure mine don't sit in water or dirt. I use them and then I rinse them immediately and try to dry them off. 
and they should last for decades. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so it's kind of like a big initial investment to purchase them if you're going to purchase them. Um, if you can get them for free, then it's kind of whatever. <laughs> but that's not like going to be common for most people. Um, right. A lot of the DIY ones that I see online only make one cell at a time because um, it's kind of it's a lot easier to just like make one PVC pipe soil block prototype than it is to make one that has like four or five blocks in it um, which I think is part of the reason totally. that's also not super accessible for people because to do one at a time I would not probably do that that would take forever to make three right. tiny things and like I'm not doing that yeah I could see it being really useful in the kind of like community gardening environment where it's just like another tool that people have access to and like you know, during the time where you're going to get your seeds started, like people take turns, morning shift, afternoon shift with the soil blockers. And like, that would be a really great, um, seems like it would be a great investment for community gardening things. Like, even yeah. if it was a really expensive product, if everybody kind of went in on it or like they devoted some kind of like of the, because I know some community gardens have like year annual fees. Mm -hmm. um, they could just like, invest in that and then yeah I don't know yeah I mean they're not like completely inaccessibly this is maybe like 40 or 50 dollars like it's not gonna okay. bankrupt you um and if you plant every year if you go through cell trays every year it will pay for itself eventually but I certainly recognize that like those big sustainable investments are not accessible for a lot of people. But I do think in a community garden setting, I mean, I have offered to like lend this out to people because it's, I'm going to use it a couple of days a year and beyond that I'll be fine. Um, and I can, I certainly make soil blocks ahead of time. Like if I'm making a bunch of the little germination blocks, I'll make some of these too, so that when they germinate, I can just immediately put them into the larger blocks. I just like watering empty blocks for a little while, but that's okay. <laughs> Um, so I think you can totally maximize usage of these and, and share them within groups of people. I think they're, they're a wonderful thing to have in community gardens. And they make ones that make like 20 of this size block at a time and they stand up and they look like big, like dynamite <laughs> detonator. Oh my God. Uh, those are certainly more expensive, but if you had like a community garden budget that could accommodate that, it's definitely more ergonomic for people's backs. Um, and yes. you maximize your efficiency that way. So I make myself little charts. Um, usually what I do is I take a little piece of thread and I tie it to one corner of the tray as a kind of like legend. And then I'll make a little grid drawing. I might actually have one, but this is my one for my current tray. Um, each of these corresponds to one like chunk of soil blocks. Mm -hmm. And I have a little star for where my thread is. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, so, I have written in each box what type of seed and what variety and also what lot number it is so that I can keep track of germination. Um, I have the like express luxury of being able to search for the most recent like germination percentage of any lot at any given time. So I keep track of the lots to like see how well my germination is compared to <laughs> what we have quoted as a company. Um, right, wow. <laughs> So I write down all my information and what date I've planted them on this piece of paper. I have certainly like labeled trays themselves before, um, but I find that I often will like make that mark go away and then I won't know anyway. Um, so I find that just making myself little keys or I'll take a picture with my phone and I will like do the markup thing where you write what it is. Yes, um, that is definitely one of my favorite methods. Yeah, it's every time I plant something, I take a picture with my phone partially so that I can remember what date I planted it on because time will just like completely escape me otherwise. <laughs> yeah, so soil blocking, I think we got it. Um, honestly, though, in terms of like making growing food or flowers or plants for fun accessible for people. I think the biggest thing is to just work with what you have. Um, like I happen to have these, which is an immense privilege, but if I didn't, I would still be growing things. Um, and I still employ stuff like 
lettuce trays to grow these are my shallot seedlings <laughs> They're doing yeah. um like still that kind of tried and true like use whatever materials you have i think that's really important especially to make things accessible for people who just wanted to start out because it's a salad container with some dirt and seeds it's like not gonna kill me if it doesn't work out i wouldn't have bought this right off the bat or probably ever maybe um totally oh you just kind of work with what you have be a little scrappy i think if you can like understand things on their on their base concept level like in order to germinate seeds i need humidity and heat and either darkness or light depending on what type of seed it is then it's pretty easy to look around and be like oh i got a, this type of container and i can stick this over the top i have like a tupperware that used to have hot wheels cars in it over my pepper seedlings right now like i'm just using whatever <laughs> It's a right. <laughs> like it doesn't need to be very specific. Mm -mm. No, you don't really need to purchase all that much um, to get started. It's so many things that we consider to be garbage are really useful for, for growing things. Totally. Yeah. I could just think of like, if ever you have plastic containers from one thing or another, you know, um, that, that could be really useful. Um, yeah. I hoard containers for that exact reason. Yes, we, <laughs> Many we definitely jars. do that here too. Yeah. <laughs> I think that the most like broad, I guess, perspective I can offer to people is, is truly to work with what's available to you. Um, it's sort of part of the fun for me to spend as little money as I can spend. So I try to like DIY things and that like that makes me excited to try to like invent solutions for the problems that I have. Um, so I think you can't really get more alternative than just looking at the materials that are around you and using them to grow your own food or flowers as opposed to purchasing things to do it. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say look at what's available in your community. Um, I'm in Maine, so the compost that's accessible to me is like seafood compost, for example. Um, I work in a distribution center, so I have a lot of pallets available to me. A lot of my, my raised beds are built out of a shipping crate that I cut in half. Um, look around and see what you can make things out of and be creative with it. I think that's kind of the most alternative and essentially radical way to garden um, is to do your best to come up with your own solutions and uh, use the resources available to you. If you are just getting into gardening and you want to know, it's a it's an overwhelming topic to get into. There's so much information and everybody has their own opinion for how things work. Um, I would say start with, start with a couple of plants that you really wanna get acquainted with and build a relationship with them. Um, every single time I'm planting something, I will look up how to grow shallots in zone 5B. Um, and other gardeners in this area will have given their input and I can decide what works best for me and what I can do with the resources that I have. YouTube is hugely important. I never really watched YouTube until I got into gardening and now I watch it like religiously. <laughs> um, so yeah, I think it's do as much internet research as you can. Um, a lot of gardeners are some of the most generous people that I know with their time and their information and their resources and their harvests. Um, people can always reach out to me if they have questions and I'm happy to help. Um, I think that information sharing and that relationship building is like inherently a part of gardening since that is tending to relationships. Um, yeah, so work with what you got. It's fun to not buy things and to make stuff out of garbage. <laughs> I think community and agriculture are inherently related to each other, at least small scale agriculture. And I think that they lend to creating the other when you have one. Um, I think no matter what your relationship is when you start to grow things, whether it's about your relationship to food or your relationship to like the climate that's in your immediate area or your relationship to the people around you, Growing things is relationship building and like relationship care. So I think it's just kind of a natural progression to expand your concept of what relationships you're caring for to the people around you. Um, and I think no matter what resources you have, whether you have space or time or materials or information or money to buy materials, um, there's always something that you can grow. I have 
sent like little microgreen starter kits to people through the mail. Um, and I'm happy to do that. If anybody's interested in that, I have plenty of microgreen seeds and I'll send you like a little Tupperware of soil and you can grow microgreens even if you live in a city. Um, I think there's a way for everybody to do that and to feel uh, connected to the things that they're putting into their body, which is, I think, a liberating practice in this late capitalist age. <laughs> 